So up to this point, we've been talking about uh, how there has to be some sort of uh, cooperativity. And for there to be cooperativity in hemoglobin, there has to be some way for the subunits to communicate with each other. So what are the actual structural uh, pieces of this hemoglobin that allows for this communication between binding sites uh, when we bind O2? And so <clears throat> this interaction actually occurs at the subunit interfaces, so in between the alpha and the beta subunits. So in this figure on the right-hand side, uh, beta subunits are shown in blue, while the alpha subunits are shown in gray. And these regions that are circled and highlighted are regions where these two interact, where there are interactions between uh, side groups uh, and uh, different functional groups of the amino acids that allow for this intersubunit communication. So the first thing that happens is O2 binds, which initiates the start of the signal. And this binds at the iron. And when there is no oxygen bound uh, to the heme, well, what happens is that the iron is slightly out of plane uh, from the plane of the heme. And so in this panel on the left-hand side, this is a diagram of deoxyhemoglobin. So there's no oxygen bound. Uh, to this particular um, ligand binding site. So this is just one of the ligand binding sites as a representative uh, form. And so the histidine, the proximal histidine, which binds to the iron on the underside of the heme uh, is up here on top in this figure. Uh, and if you look closely at the figure, uh, you can see that the iron is slightly out of the plane of the heme. And also the heme is also a little puckered, uh, which uh, which also contributes to this. On the bottom side is the distal histidine, and so that's the histidine that helps to hydrogen bond the oxygen. So on the bottom side in this figure is where oxygen binds to iron. All right. When oxygen binds to the iron, now there's a change in the conformation of the iron. So actually, when the oxygen binds to the iron, what happens is it pulls the iron back into the plane of the histidine. So now this is in the center of the hist uh, of the uh, excuse me the plane of the heme. And so we can see this in this middle panel here uh, where the iron is back in the plane of the heme. And so the effect of that is that oxygen pulls the iron into the plane of the heme and the proximal histidine that's also bound to the iron gets pulled as well. Now what's important about that and can see be seen clearly on this right hand panel is that the histidine is attached uh, to this uh, helix called the F helix. And so the F helix is like a lever that the histine is attached to. And when oxygen binds and pulls the iron, it pulls the histidine and it pulls this uh, lever, this F helix lever. And that has an effect that uh, that helix is at the subunit interface. And that allows, that initiates this communication between the subunits. And to see what actually causes that, we look a little bit closer. So. Here's the F helix uh, in this diagram. Again, the blue are the beta subunits. Uh, the gray are the alpha subunits. The F helix is labeled here uh, along the helix. And again, that's the helix that's connected to the proximal histidine. So as oxygen binds, pulls the iron, pulls the histidine, and pulls the helix, uh, that starts to disrupt some very important interactions happening at the subunit interface. So to look a little bit closer at what those interactions are, uh, we can see uh, three amino acids here. And so there's an aspartate FG1 uh, shown in this figure, uh, his HC3, and a lysine C5. Okay, so importantly, aspartate, histidine, and lysine. So this aspartate, as we would expect, at physiological pH is going to have a negative charge. Okay, that's the aspartate. Here's let's change it to something else. Aspartate. All right, this is here's our F helix. Terrible. Uh, let's try that again. Yeah. Nope. F helix. 
Okay. And so as we might expect, uh, because this is a carboxylate, which has a pK around 4, um, at physiological pH of 7.3, uh, we expect this to have a negative charge. Bridging this is this histine HC3. And so this is important. Because this histidine has two important structural features to it. One is the C terminus. This peptide backbone. The C terminus is negatively charged, and we'll get to that why that's important. But importantly, this histidine is doubly protonated. And because of that, it has a positive charge. So the interaction between his HC3 and the aspartate FG1. is actually an electrostatic interaction. So there's an interaction between a negative and a positive charge. So this is slightly stronger than a typical H-bond, even though uh, if you looked at it, it would look more like an H-bond, okay? In addition, as I said, this is the C-terminal, uh, this is the C-terminal residue of the, uh, of the beta subunit. And so what that means is that there's this C terminus, this carboxylate, which is also negatively charged. And that interacts with another residue in the alpha subunit, which we'll show in yellow. And this is the side chain of the alpha subunit. This is the, light, the side chain of lysine C5, which has, at the end of the side chain, has a positively charged amine group uh, at, uh, at physiological pH. So once again, we have another electrostatic interaction uh, across this subunit interface between the alpha subunit and these residues, which are part of the beta subunit. Okay. We'll Note this here. So what happens then is this is the basis for communication between the beta subunit, between uh, where the heme binds, uh, oxygen binds to the iron and the heme, that pulls the proximal histine of the F that's attached to this F helix, that pulls on this aspartate FG1, and what that does is that separates uh, that separates this negative charge and this positive charge of aspartate FG1 and histidine HC3. So that breaks apart this uh, electrostatic charge or this electrostatic interaction, which is known as an ion pair. In addition, when that happens, that also affects uh, what's going on at the alpha subunit. And in the end, this histidine, this histidine turns away. So no longer is there communication between the aspartate to the histine and to the lysine. So these are effectively not connected anymore through this bridge caused by these electrostatic interactions. And when that disappears, what happens is you go, you switch, uh, you have a tendency to sh shift the equilibrium from the tent state where all of this stabilizes the T state, the tent state. And then when this histine goes down, uh, that promotes formation of the relaxed state instead. And remember, the relaxed state is really important because the relaxed state is a higher affinity uh, for oxygen. And so shifting this equilibrium to the, of the protein towards going towards the R state after binding of one molecule of oxygen helps promote more binding of oxygen 
at the other subunits in the heme, uh, in hemoglobin. And this is, uh, this what is what accounts for this cooperative behavior that we see, where as we increase, uh, as we bind one oxygen, we increases, increase our chances of binding uh, two, three, and four oxygens.